Good morning and welcome to the HR Congress podcast. Today, we're going to be featuring a keynote presentation that was delivered by Dr. Mark Van Dongen at the 2019 Digital HR Innovation Summit. This presentation was the closing keynote at the event and was on the subject of demographics and robotization, looking into critical topics impacting the future of work and how to tackle them. We hope that you find the presentation interesting and make sure you subscribe to the HR Congress podcast for the latest updates and episodes. What I'll be talking about is indeed some social, economical, and technical impacts. Now, what is my background? Yes, I'm in HR. I'm an industrial psychologist by trade, uh, so I like data. I like numbers, so you'll get to see a few. And my PhD at the end was in economics, so I'll combine the two items. Now, where does this, this, this passion on the topic come from? Uh, a, a colleague of mine sent me a TED talk, it was just last week, about a guy, now you have to correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew Chakoyan who did a TED talk, and amongst others, he is also a digital native, and one of the things he said is, you know, there are three and a half billion jobs in the world, 50% of those jobs will disappear because of digitization. Another one, I was starting off this week, I was in, in, in Poland, and there in the, the local magazine, the Aktion Index, it sounds more German, but it seems to be Polish, in 2034, 40% of the Polish jobs will disappear. That is just not true. I'll show you later why it's not true. Now, what I'm going to show you, of course, yes, I'll use facts, but it is my opinion. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Because, of course, if I could predict the future, in 1975, I would have given $10,000 to Steve Jobs, and I'd be bloody rich by now. I didn't, so I must make mistakes. So, first bit of demographic changes. This is for those who read the literature, nothing new. Our children, the children now at school, have a 50% chance of becoming 100. I then looked into the mortality tables of the US from 2014, I could find those. Uh, men have a 1% chance of becoming 100 there, and women 2.8%. So it's a huge change. Well, this is of course only a change for the better. Now let's look at what other effects we actually have. I'll make some very simple calculations, because living towards 100 is nice if you have money. Let's talk about that small detail. Regular pension plans, pay you 8% or have an accrual for 8% pension. Suppose you retire at 65, 67 or 70, 63 in France, okay, but they don't work that hard. Uh, so suppose you go eight years beyond that. How are you going to finance the next 24 years? Just look at this. At the moment, 17% of the EU 28 are pensionable. In 2015, that will be 26%. Very simple calculation. About a quarter is too young to work, so only 50% of the population will work, and they will need to feed the other 50%. You just have an idea of what that would do to your Social Security contribution in 2050. Well, perhaps you don't work anymore then, but still, your children then. So less people are going to work, and on the other hand, we have labor substitution, we replace labor by capital, so we'll have less and less Social Security contributions coming in. Lower birth rates, less and less people start to work. Now, I did a very simple beer coaster calculation. A beer coaster is this little piece of stuff you put under a, a beer glass when you're in the bar. If you're looking at governmental pension plans, these are so-called pay-as-you-go schemes. You're in HR, you know what that is. It means that now we pay for the people who are now retired. Governments do not create accruals. They pay from the income they now have. I just made a, a bit of a calculation. If we're looking at the state pension, one of the three legs, typically you have state, company and private, and then company pensions, for instance, Germany, Great Britain and Finland, they don't necessarily have that. In the other most European countries, it's mandatory. So, let's just make an assumption. Because we said people will live a lot longer, perhaps not 100, let's make it 99. Assume an underfunding of just 50,000 euros per person. So that is one to two years to live from. If you then see at the moment we have 518 inhabitants, we're going to 530 inhabitants. That means, de facto, if 26% of those are retired and they need 50,000 a euro, 
we have a shortage of 7 trillion euro. Just under the assumption that this is right, and I can already tell you this is not right. But this is an educated guess, somewhat educated guess. Let's have a little bit of a look, because other, again, much more clever people, did an idea. Anybody an idea? This comes from uh, the OECD. The OECD did a prediction what is currently the pension deficits of the states, of the 20 richest OECD states. If you know that their budget deficit is 44 trillion at the moment, what would you guess is our pension deficit on top of that? 78 trillion. Now you'd wonder, how on earth can that be? Because the, the budget deficit is only 44 trillion. Now you, we have to ask that our finance colleagues, because a pension deficit is an obligation in the future you don't keep in the books. And therefore, you can have both. You can have 40, 44 trillion deficit, which is money which is not there in the books, which is negative. And on top of that, you can have 78 trillion pension deficit. So if at the moment there is a pension deficit like that, how do you think the states are going to react on massive reduction of jobs because of automation? Because where on earth are they going to get the money from to pay the future pensionaries? Now, some of these things might seem very theoretical, but if you pay, pay good attention, when Macron in France was elected, one of the items he had on his electoral campaign was a fine for automation of jobs. Well, officially in economic terms, we then call it demerit. Sounds nicer, but it's the same thing. In other words, a taxation if you would dare to automate jobs. It didn't get through, like some of the other things that he planned, but okay. But it does go to show that certain states are thinking about it by now. These are the state pension plans, then we have the corporate pension plans. They're doing it a lot better, relatively speaking. Standard & Poor's 500, 403 billion underfunding, and uh, Financial Times, FTSE, 184 billion GDP. Now, the reason why in the US the underfunding in US dollars is higher percentage-wise than it is in the FTSE is, relatively speaking, simple. Most US pension plans are 401k plans. 401k plans are plans based on the share value of the company. Therefore, if what the economists now in 2019 are predicted, we are going into a crisis coming forward, this deficit will increase substantially because it is based on shares versus in Europe where it is based on either financing in the company or, for instance, insurance backing. That was just a bit on the financial, just to make you feel happy. Now let's go to the next point. How long do we actually assume we need to work? Uh, let's, let's now assume we base ourselves on this. At the moment, this is the calculation. Okay, pension actuaries would now stone me, but simplifying, this is what it is. You pay 10% pension premium for about 40 years. That makes four years of salary, 50% final pay. Okay, it's intermediate pay, but okay. Eight years of pension. So if you now retire at 65, you can have your income until 73. So this is how it looks like. If you have a 10% pension contribution, you, you have a pension until 73. If it's 20, of course, it's double the time. So you go to 81, etc. Now, suppose indeed we get to live to be 100. How long would you then think you have to work in order to have money to make it to 100 and not die of starvation in the meantime? If you have a regular normal pension plan of 10%, it means you have to work until you're 88 in order to have pension up to 100. If you go into the more executive pension plans, hey, your 20% contribution, bless them, they can work until they're 80. But now the question, if we're looking at an industrialized environment like mine, where are these people going to work until they're 80? And we have, for those who, doesn't, who don't know ArcelorMittal, let me take you a step there. ArcelorMittal is a steel company. We produce just about 90 million tons of steel every year. We have 200,000 employees. As was said, I'm uh, HR mining operations. What are the challenges I deal with when I don't speak here? Just as an example, uh, we, are, we have a mine in Liberia. From the mine, the ore needs to go to the coast. So we're building a conveyor belt. So you think, big deal, conveyor belt. That conveyor belt is 50 kilometers. It's a 200 million investment. The alternative is we have trucks going up and down that would need 450 trucks in full continuous mode, meaning 600 drivers. They don't exist in Liberia. Those are the normal HR challenges. 
industrial organizations deal with. Next to Indeed, thinking about these, and therefore you can also imagine that putting these things on the agenda is not always on the forefront of senior leadership. But I do think, and I'll take you further, that indeed it's one of our tasks to bring it there, because it is something that's going to come to us. Let's go and have a look at artificial intelligence. Moravik's paradox is that if you're looking at artificial intelligence, high-level reasoning is the easiest thing to compute. It's called narrow artificial intelligence versus sensor-motorical, which is immensely difficult to compute. In broad AI, sensor-motorical, what they did is they tried a computer to put together an IKEA chair. Now, I can assure you, to put a full interior of IKEA together, it's one of the best tests for a marriage there is. But a chair typically is still doable. And in this case, indeed, the robot, the, it was so complicated that they couldn't program it. Whereas if we're looking to another task, for instance, chess. The famous computer Deep Blue defeated Kasparov, the reigning world champion in chess, in 96. But now come to think, because of course, all AI, HR people, you know Moore's law. Moore's law says that every two years, the calculation capacity per square centimeter doubles. If we take that from 96, it means we have now a a calculation capacity about 4,100 bigger than that. And that is indeed a bit frightening, because just imagine what that calculation capacity can all do. Now, talking about narrow and broad AI, indeed narrow artificial intelligence jobs will be automated earlier, because it's easier to program. What kind of jobs are we then looking for? And white collars we're all automatically thinking of. But there's been some interesting items. Operational finance we know, shared service centers, uh, that's been something happening uh, some time already. Back office people, yes, make, make sense. Transactional activities, we can automate that. There's been very good tests done at the moment that artificial intelligence can find the relative legislation a lot quicker than lawyers can. There's been a good study done that uh, the average uh, intelligence of lawyers with a PhD degree is below average academic level. But that is studies, you just have to know which one to pick. Uh, but therefore, lawyers. On the other hand, airline pilots. No doubt you know that the airplanes are safer without the pilot in it. Because most airplane errors are pilot errors. Because the pilot interprets the data and thinks they know better. Whereas the only thing a pilot normally does in an airplane is take off and land and monitor the systems in between, because the computer flies. In the space shuttle, a thing long retired, there were already five computers working simultaneously to make that thing fly. It could fly without a pilot, but the pilot couldn't fly without the computers. So why do we think we actually need pilots? As I said before, I don't think all these jobs will be replaced by artificial intelligence, because there's going to be a social issue coming up. What is, however, an issue is if you can automate a job, that means there is an alternative versus having the employee. If you have alternative, therefore, multiple offerings, what does it do to the price of the product? it reduces, and indeed, salaries drop in categories that can be automated. Because in the union negotiations, the other point of the discussion is, I can also outsource it, because that's a possibility. So that is one of the, one of the effects that it is. As an example, uh, they said if, if a job can be automated, the automatic effect on the wages is about 3.5% wage reduction. Now, what will, of course, happen? Some jobs, from a content perspective, might disappear, but others one will appear. This is a, a Gardner study from 2017 saying uh, by 2020, 1.8 million jobs will disappear. But on the other hand, 2.3 new jobs will appear. Our challenge is mostly, can actually the people whose jobs disappear do those new roles that appear? And that is a real challenge from a developmental perspective, e.g. it's an HR issue. New jobs coming up, ask for new skills. What are the challenges? Who ensures that people have the right skills? And 68% of the children now in school will work in jobs that don't yet exist. So how do we prepare them for the new skills? Because we have no clue what they're going to do, because the job doesn't exist yet. And is this a state responsibility? Should the schools fix that? It's relative, because we are going to get the issue at the end. We are going to get people from schools who don't have the skills we need. So perhaps we should think about taking accountabilities as business to find a way to resolve such issues. Because, of course, irrespective of what we do, yeah, certain skills are needed, so if we don't take action, the skills will not be there. And how many people are we then talking about? 
At the moment, the assumption is that in 2020, 20.3 20 million people with the right skills globally will be missing. And if nothing much changes, we're talking about 40 million by 2025 or 85 million by 2030. That leads, however, to a loss of income that could be generated of 8.5 trillion US dollars over that time. This was, again, good stolen. You see it on the top. It's Corn Ferry Research. But it is something, therefore, that shows actually the value if we don't do something about the skill deficits we're facing. Now, and combine these items together, lower birth rate shortened of the right skills, so the right skills will go up in price. And indeed, on average, they predict that people with the right skill on average go up $11,000 per year. So in the long run, the cost of such jobs will increase substantially. Another item, if you start replacing indeed capital of a labor by capital, you see this. This is the share of income generated by labor from 70s to 2010. Now, knowing that we talked in the start about that we have a pension deficit that needs to be compensated by social security contributions, they come from labor. So if this trend continues, it will have an effect on the deficit. At the moment, we are talking about 70-30, so 70% is generated through labor, 30 by capital, and the trend is the other way around, that it'll be 30-70. If that happens, feel free to calculate, it's a 56% reduction of income for the states. So this says, indeed, government needs to find new income, so amongst others, income out of the return of capital employed, investment of, in capital that, that remove jobs, and perhaps an additional taxation on that. And another prediction made in the market that was done by Citibank is that governments might actually push the state retirement to the companies, stop providing government pension altogether, because they can't afford it. Companies, they can make accruals. Therefore, they should not have a deficit at the end. But not just negative. There are also positive things about robotization and automation. If we're thinking about, remember the 10% pension contribution, the individual having to work until 88, that person working on the, on, the, the normal, uh, com, uh, on the normal belt, on the normal assembly line, and needs to work about uh, 23 years longer than now. So we're seeing here that manual jobs will most likely not be replaced, but they can be augmented. And there is indeed one of the ways is to use robotization to augment uh, human capabilities, to allow them to work longer. And one of the items we have there is the so-called exoskeleton, now, this is a bit the advanced version of Mr. Stark, but there are actually good other examples. This is Ford Motor Company in the US, where this individual is having exoskeleton on his back to reduce the strain on his uh, shoulder, so he can keep doing the same work longer. And those are items we might be looking towards in the future to keep people much longer productive. That is for the blue-collar workers. On the white-collar, things will also change. Knowledge workers might become much more privately employed workers instead of regular employees if we have them now. Now, what would that mean? I call it always least human capital goods. Because HR, you know in economic terms, a resource is something that is used up in the production process, whereas a capital good is a good that adds value towards the production process, but itself is not changed. Therefore, for people, human capital goods fits a lot better. Now, why least? Because the people don't belong to you. They can leave if they want. There is an annual negotiation. We renegotiate the lease contract. We call that wage negotiations. And as long as we pay the salary they feel is fair for their service, they'll stay. Or, specifically in the younger generation, they'll leave and they'll go somewhere else. But these service contracts have, of course, some ups and downs. The ups for the company is it's much more flexible. The downs for the employee is they need to build in a sort of risk premium for themselves. Because what if they get ill? They don't get paid. So in the long run, these contracts are going to be more expensive to the companies. That means, knowing that, but the companies need to work hard to make sure that the efficiency of those people under such contracts is increasing. And there, indeed, we see a great work for narrow artificial intelligence to indeed make sure that the work which has low added value towards their high cost is taken over by artificial intelligence. In summary, I have some of the effects. First one was reduced amount of workers simply by the demographic buildup. Still, we still need to save on fixed costs. That hasn't changed. Longevity impacts the pensionable age. You, you will retire probably 80. I'm, I'm a little closer. I'll retire, I'll retire a little earlier. And people will go much more to individual contracts. Now, what is the effect of these things? We're going to have to substitute some of the labor because there will simply not be enough people to do it. 
So if we want to keep doing the same work, it is not taking away jobs because there are less people to do the jobs. So you'll see a, re a reduction of available jobs, but we said as well, jobs that can be automated, there will be a reduction in salary level there. That both reduces the income the government gets through Social Security, therefore they need to find alternatives. For instance, ta taxation on capital investment or shift the pension risk to the companies. Both of them leads to increased cost. So there we see robotization is absolutely needed to increase the productivity and engage the workforce longer. In that way, we can make sure that we can actually deal with the increased cost from that side. Going to the lower side, longevity, the industry needs to uphold productivity for the aging workforce. Or the individual contracts, it's more expensive. Hence, we need to make sure that we augment their capabilities to increase or, in case of the aging workers, to uphold the productivity. So we can afford ourselves, and we can afford it also, to keep these people in the manufacturing. And that, in my view, leads that the robotization will much more go from replacing to augmenting labor and increasing productivity of existing workforce in the future, instead of making jobs or uh, making real work disappear.